Welcome to the ex bonus August 21st Electric Railroaders Association meeting. My name is Bob Neuhauser. In the event that you have problems uh, seeing the presentation, what I suggest is you log out, log back in. I will let you back in. If that doesn't work, uh, send me a text. My text number is 917-482-4235. It's 917-482-4235. And I'm still letting some people in as we go. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so I think we have, uh, we have, we right now have about 76 participants spanning Australia, North America, and Europe. So we welcome all of you, and there's a, quite a few people who are also, uh, who are also uh, members of other organizations, and we welcome you as well. Uh, before we start our program, I have a few announcements to make, and then I will introduce uh, I will introduce our speaker tonight. First of all, I'm going to ask for a moment of silence for two recently two uh, recent ERA members who unfortunately are no longer with us who have passed on. One is Larry Furlong, other one is Bill Madden, and I think many of you know both of them. What I'd like to do right now is I'd like to ask for a moment of silence before we go on. So let's have a moment of silence now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the moment of silence. So. I'd like to make a few announcements before I introduce our speaker. So very, very important. While we normally have our meetings on the third Friday of the month, next month because of the Jewish holiday, the Jewish New Year's, uh, the meeting will be on September, Friday, September 25th, which is the fourth Friday of the month. So please note that it's the fourth Friday of the month not the third. We're normally third Friday of the month, but uh, that one meeting will be on the fourth Friday. Our speaker will be Russ Jackson, who's retired from uh, from Philadelphia, Southeast Pennsylvania uh, Transportation Authority, and he's going to be regaling us with a whole bunch of Super 8 videos of, of uh, commuter rail, New York commuter rail, and Philadelphia subway cars. Uh, back to the third, back to the 30s and 40s. It should be a great program. Okay, um, so we have a number of important announcements. You're going to see these announcements also on erausa.org. Again, erausa.org is our website. About three or four days before, we always put the Zoom login on the top of that website. So make sure you go there. We do send a reminder, but you can always look on the website three or four days before the meeting as to uh, where to log in and you all have obviously gotten the message. So uh, welcome. Uh, now it's all 83 of you. All right, <clears throat> a few of you brought this question up, 2021 meetings. I know all of you have greatly enjoyed the Zoom meetings, and as long as hotels are on lockdown, we will continue to have Zoom meetings. If, however, the hotel does reopen for 2021, what we are going to do is a compromise. We will have meetings in the hotel in the months of January, March, May, September, and November. We will have Zoom meetings in all the other months, February, April, June, October, and December, but we will skip July and August. Now, you will not lose out with the hotel meetings. We are going to introduce it. We have another innovation we've introduced. We are recording all these meetings. So the hotel meetings will also be recorded. It's just they won't be live. They are all posted on the website, erausa.org. 
the, the recordings are usually posted about, about mm, two weeks after the meeting. So you'll be able to see the whole meeting. You just won't be able to, uh, you won't be able to post questions into a chat. That's the only thing. But half of our meetings will be on Zoom. Half of the meetings will be uh, live. But of course, that depends on the hotel reopening. OK. Second uh, announcement is, uh, I know many of you have been waiting for the L book, the L book on Brooklyn by Erica Zustowitz. Volume one will be coming out at the end of 2020. It is 400 pages. It's the equivalent of five issues of, uh, of headlights. Um, it is ultimately going to be uh, three volumes. Uh, the first volume uh, covers the BMT and its predecessor from 1864 to 1940. To 1940 take over the Board of Transportation. Volume two covers BMT post 1940 to 1969 and will include photographs of every former BMT elevated station in route order. Finally, volume three will contain a plethora of high quality color photographs from the 1950s and 1960s and a detailed roster of all equipment in existence from 1864 to 1969. But end of this year, you should be getting volume one. Okay, I have uh, three short announcements then we start. Uh, I really welcome all, really welcome all the members from the other clubs. I think there's some BSRA, there's CERA, I think Railroad Enthusiasts, uh, East Penn. Um, keeping up our archives, putting out the bulletins, uh, even the Zoom rental for our large group, all of that costs. Um, please consider, if you are not currently a member of, the, of, e, of ERA, please join. You can join our online, again, at erausa.org. You just click on the button for membership. In addition, this month, we have added an additional button to make it easy to donate. If you go, again, to the website, erausa.org, you will find the announcement about how to donate. You will be getting our dues renewal letter, those of you who are members for 2021, and even with our various uh, programs to streamline uh, our costs, um, our expenses are exceeding revenues by 40,000 per year. The main reason is we try to keep the cost of the bulletin affordable, bulletin and, and headlights. But if this thing does not change, it's gonna be difficult for ERA to continue beyond the 2023 membership year. So please consider making a donation this year to help ERA continue. It's now 86 year record of traction education and entertainment. The online form will make it much easier uh, for you to donate. So that's it. I'm ready now to go into our program and to our main event, our speaker, Andrew Rudasi. Let me explain how uh, I think most of you have been to our programs. So um, first of all, I'm going to ask everybody to turn off their videos. Please do that on your own. If you don't do it as the program starts, I'm going to go in and turn the video off. That's because we're a big group and sometimes the bandwidth slows down. So the only pictures I want to see is Andrew, our speaker, and, and uh, myself as the host. Now, if because we're a big group, we're now up to 86 people. If you have questions, what, I, what we'd like you to do is go to the chat button. You can post your questions. You can post them to everyone. Sometimes other members will have the answer to your question. If your question remains unanswered, when Andrew gets to a logical breath or break, I will ask him the questions and then he will uh, he won't answer. So that's it. And now I'm going to give a short introduction to Andrew Ludasi. Uh, Andrew uh, is in his second career working in rail freight for New Jersey Department of Transportation. His show will feature a combination of slides or the images and a few videos. His show will feature Milan, Berlin, 
Cottbus, Germany, Hamburg, Takamatsu, Mexico City, and a recent trip to Colorado in September 2019, plus Lisbon and Sintra. So this is a really wide ranging set of topics and we start with the uh, uh, we start with the first slide that all of you have seen. So please enjoy the show. If you have uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, please put them in the chat, and I will make sure to catch them. Okay, Andrew, uh, take it away. Okay, um, everyone can hear me, I guess. Thanks for the introduction. Um, there's been a slight change. Uh, I took Takamatsu out of the, and replaced it with some other things because I'd already shown Takamatsu to the group in 2018. I went through and I, and I thought I'd only shown some night shots. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this, this is my first picture. This is from the Seashore Trolley Museum back in uh, 2014. Uh, this picture, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a group known as the Mystic Valley Railway Society. They're based out of Boston. The annual membership fee is $10 and they produce a really nice calendar. Um, August of this year, this picture is in the calendar. So I'm rather proud of the fact that they, they chose this picture. It's just two of the Connecticut company um, breezers that you know used to run well before my time, but people used to ride them the Yale Bowl but they had two of them out that August when I visited. Um, this is from my hometown. I'm originally from Montreal, but I was born too late to actually ride any of these. Um, Seashore has one of them. The museum in Montreal has two and Warehouse Point has the fourth. Uh, Warehouse Point also runs theirs. And I was told recently that the Montreal ones have also been restored um, in, at Expo Rail. So these, these used to run around Montreal on sightseeing trips. They were taken out of service, I believe only one or two years before the whole system shut down in 59. Um, and I really like these, the, uh, the beavers with the maple leaf as the decoration. You'll notice the uh, subway car in the background. They had taken that out as well that day, but I'm not showing that. This is just to show you where I originally was from. I am not sure where this, this is at seashore, and I'm not sure what this double decker uh, trolley is as to, I lost, uh, but it's interesting. I think it's, it's probably from somewhere in Europe, possibly England. Um, I am a contributor at Branford, and this was the brick that I bought when uh, Branford was raising money for um, after Hurricane Sandy and the elevating the collection. Um, this is at Brantford. This is actually two days before I was at Seashore. This is one of their Johnstown cars. Um, I have a few pictures, I think, at Brantford. Yeah, another Montreal car. And then this one they use a lot, the, um, the former Atlanta car, which is out most often when I go up there. And this was on Members Day in 2018, yes. And it was one of the last times that I saw Phil Craig. And there's one of our members, Jack May, as well, writing. They actually took out on Members Day um, some snow plows, and you could actually ride um, work equipment, which is kind of unusual. The next, now we're going to jump to various places I've been over the years. This is Milan. This is a map of the Milan Metro and the tram system. The tram system is in red. Um, I'm just going to concentrate on one of the lines. This line, line four, which goes from here in the center of the city from Cairoli and a loop at Piazza Castello runs north and it runs on a new private right of way out to Niguarda. Unfortunately, uh, the line north of Niguarda is no longer, that was an interurban, is no longer in service. But I was there in 2009, I believe that's, let me just check, I think, yeah, 2009. 
So I still, I didn't get a chance, I didn't have enough time to ride this line, but I did get to photograph it at the terminal. So here we are at Cairoli on um, Sirio. They're single ended in Milan. Um, they have kind of like a blunt end on the other end because everywhere in Milan they have loops. This is the interior of the car. And then this is the an older map that shows you where the two interurban lines went, Niguarda to Desio and Afori to Limbiari. Both are out of service. This line I did ride and take pictures of, but they're slides and I don't have them digitized. That's from earlier. So this is the loop at uh, Niguarda, and you can still see where the tracks went for the interurban and made the sort of diagonal crossing here. Um, this is also different uh, things you can look at on the web. This was this is one of their um, single articulated cars. They seem to alternate this type of car with the Serio cars on that service. And here, here are two of them at the outer end and looping around this. And then uh, this is the interurban. These cars are quite old. They are built by Stanga, I believe, uh, and they go back to, they've been rebuilt and modernized, but they, do, they are quite old. Um, as I say, these are now out of service. This entire line is not operating. Um, these are captures from Google street level, just to give you an idea of how, if you're not able to travel, you can still look at trolleys and they, they produce them in pretty high resolution. This is the same spot and it's different years. This is 2008 and then you can actually see street level views in some places over a different time period. So here's one from 2014 in the other colors, the more traditional orange and here's one recently in 2019. Um, again, a street level view back in 2008, you could still see the tracks where they went off and the interurban line was operating. And more recently, you can see how it's been paved over and the tracks are overgrown. And I just threw this in. This is the one of the main tourist uh, draws in Milan is the cathedral in the center of the city. Then I flew off to uh, Berlin on that trip and this was the view from the airplane. Here we are in the Berlin Transport Museum. Um, I don't have a list of where this car is from, but I can see that it's a model and it was made for a three phase system in which the wires seem to be vertical over the car. I don't know and I don't remember where this type of car ever actually ran. Um, this is the uh, Kaiser's car, note the, uh, the crown on it. Um, also in the Berlin Transport Museum on one of their electrified railways. Um, the controller. And then this is a, this goes back to Ron Yi, uh, the previous show, uh, gave us a lot of views of Berlin. This is what the Berlin system looked like in 1896, but they already had the loop. The I don't think they want the, the audio on. No. Um, this, unfortunately, is no longer open in Berlin. This was a giant model called LOXX. It was at Alexanderplatz. Um, and they even reproduced the, the tower, which is now T-Mobile. And they have operating trolleys on it. This is a Tatra car um, running along street level. It's quite, it was a really nice model. It was totally computerized, but I don't know why they... Uh, they, they shut it down. This was on a trip, a different trip to Berlin, and I'm changing trains in Leipzig in 2010. Um, Leipzig claims to be the largest railroad station with the most number of tracks, at least of this type in the world. I don't think it's used as much as originally when it was built. It's still, of course, very busy. Um, I had to change trains here because I was flying I was supposed to fly into Berlin. There was a snowstorm on the East Coast 
they let me go out a day early, but they didn't have a flight to Berlin. So I had to fly to Frankfurt and take a train and I had to connect uh, across the platform between two ICEs. Um, this is one of the trains there. This is some kind of a uh, local uh, commuter type service. This I threw in in Berlin. Um, this is in East Berlin in a new housing development. In some places they left up the old uh, watchtowers from the Berlin Wall. Uh, now back to train travel. This is the new Hauptbahnhof. Um, I'm vis going to visit the town of Cottbus, which is over near the Polish border. It has a fairly extensive tram system for a very small uh, city. Um, another little bit of my own travels. I actually arrived in Berlin. I'm trying to remember what year it was because I've been to Berlin a few times. The day the new train station opened. So here we are on one of the platforms. Uh, these are the regional double-decker type uh, commuter to regional trains that I was taking out to. A Andrew, it was 2006 when the new train station opened. Okay. I was there. It was in May, I believe, and I actually arrived on the day it opened. That sounds right, yes. Um, this is taking the train um, along. This is looking out to the what's called the Museum Island. And next, here is Cottbus. Um, some of the maps I've put in here are from uh, Urban Rail. Robert Schwandel has a really good website with uh, maps of every town that has a tram system and subway systems. So you arrive at the Hauptbahnhof and I wrote a fair number of the lines. I was just out there for a day trip, basically on the north end. So I wrote out, I know I wrote out to line number to number four, part of this, then around and into the center of the city, the Altmarkt, and also visited one of those. I said, um, open streets map uh, is very useful. They actually have literally track maps of the, tra the trolley systems in, or the, the street railway systems in many places. So you can actually see the rather complicated track arrangement in front of the Hauptbahnhof and then there is one place where they have a sort of a grand union as well, a little bit north of here. So here we are on the tram system. It was, it was February of 2010. It, was, it wasn't terribly cold, but snow had fallen everywhere. So there was slush. And these are Tatra cars where they've inserted a low floor section into the middle of them. Almost all the cars have some sort of advertising or wrapping on them. Uh, that's the interior of the Tatra car. And then this is the line ends here at this loop, but there's a long section to go to where the uh, shops are, but it was too, too far to walk in the, in the winter. Here it is in the trees on the loop. And then this is going by one of the uh, typical East German housing estates. This one actually is not, not terrible. Some of them are pretty, pretty ugly and drab. There's some good uh, private right of way. Uh, so you can see snow covered and there's a walkway on one side where people can get to their buildings. This is one of the wrapped cars. Uh, here's another one coming around the corner. And then uh, this was around this area here where the two lines meet. This over here is a brand new university with a very interesting building uh, built by, I can't remember the name, Muron and something architect who, um, I think there's, I put one picture in here. This is along one of the streets again, um, with these wrapped cars, oh yeah. There seems to be a real interest in everything American, an American diner and Frank Sinatra. Um, here it is, there's the Grand Union, and this is the old Altmarkt, which I actually took a picture of without the trams on it. Uh, has a nice uh, sort of atmospheric look. It looks like a typical old German city. And this is another one of their wrapped cars, again, with um, emphasis on America. Yeah, they have a 
it's a chain there, it seems, in that town, Pizza America. This was on the way back. These are the, um, the mainline locomotives. Um, I think these are mostly freight. I, I don't think I've seen these pull passenger equipment. Then I stopped at the Uban Museum, which is only open, I think, one day a month. And I had been to Berlin many times and had never gotten there. The, it's at the far west end of Olympia Stadium. And it is also on the U-Bahn, so it's active. The museum is above it in a building that has um, an operating board like this, so you can actually see the, um, the tracks. And here's a more modern, one of these, uh, one of their more modern cars that uh, has the open gangway type of seating inside. Then there's a little short trip I took to Hamburg at the end of that trip. Um, I, there, there are no more st uh, street railways in Hamburg. It's one of the f cities in Germany that abandoned them a long time ago. And now all they have is their subway, their U-Bahn, as well as their uh, regional commuter network. My hotel was right across the street from the main railway station. And it was winter, so it was kind of foggy. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a morning view, then an afternoon view when it got uh, clearer, and a view out at night. Unfortunately, I think I had to put the camera on something so the railing got in the way. This is the Hochbahn, which is the um, also the subway. Part of it's elevated. It uses some f quite small cars. They tend to be rather narrow and smaller than the IRT system, but not quite as small as the London tube. Um, this is an unused station. It's not abandoned. It was built and never used. It is, um, if I remember correctly, it's, there's a station next to it. It's, you can kind of see into it. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the station. If I go back to the map, um, it is, is one of the stations right here. It is, I believe, it, it's rather complicated. I tried to read up the history of how it happened. They, they changed their mind as they were building some of the new lines. And it's, I think it's Hauptbahnhof Nord. So it's one of the stations that would have been here and they rerouted the train into a different tunnel and now they don't use that particular station. Andrew, there was a question in the chat. Do you have an idea of how the width in Hamburg compares to lines one to five in Madrid, which I think were their original narrow profile lines? Yeah, which are, which are very much like the Paris system, almost identical. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I, they could be the same width, I'm not sure. I would, I'll tell the person in chat all that information is usually pretty easily available either in Wikipedia or go to the website metro.net, which will have yeah, that. Urban Rail. Urban Rail may have it. One of those will have it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is one of the regional, um, very common in Europe, double decker type commuter equipment. Um, and usually the, the, there's, um, unlike New Jersey Transit, the entrances in some of these cars is a ramp to go down to the lower level. Um, now we're gonna jump to Mexico City. Um, I was in Mexico City in 2010 in April. I had started the trip actually to go and take the famous train ride at the Copper Canyon and then went to Mexico City in Puebla. Um, Mexico City has um, trolley buses uh, one light rail line, this one in the south, that goes to the gardens from the end of the metro to, to Xochimilco. And this line here, which goes from the railway station, uh, Buenaventura, I think it's uh, up north this way. That was brand new when I was there in 2010. It had just opened. Um, this is a map of the, um, the light rail which goes here. Once upon a time, I know it went onto the street and went farther into town. These are the famous floating gardens. Um, this is at the north end at the loop. It's all, um, it's all high floor loading. Uh, they, they did run PCCs on this for a while. 
before my time. Um, so these, this is the one, one of the pictures in the floating gardens. And then we're back to the trolleys. This is one stop from Xochimilco. It's very, it's very near the next station. They're very close to each other. So it's a short walk and it was easy to get a number of pictures at the time. Um, there's the Xochimilco station and the next one is called Francisco Goita and it is really very close. There it is from some good views from above. Um, this is at the loop back at um, Tasqueña at the end of the metro line. And then this is uh, the metro. The metro in Mexico City is almost all the lines are rubber tired, very much like Paris, Montreal, well, four of the lines in Paris, uh, all of Montreal, uh, Santiago, Chile, some of the lines in Lyon. This is in front of the uh, Palacio de Bellas Artes, which is their concert hall and opera house. Uh, you'll notice the Contraflow trolley bus. And on this side, there's a reserved lane. Surprisingly for Mexico, obviously people don't tend to go into the Contraflow line, but there was not a lot of impingement of traffic into this one either. Um, which Here's another view of it on the Contraflow section. This building is the head office of Pemex. Many years earlier, I'd once been to Mexico City on business. I was visiting a client in this tower and Mexico City is famous for, infamous for their air pollution. Uh, this was a nice day, but I was up there and suddenly I could see the volcanoes and the people I was working with were saying, wow, we barely ever get to see that anymore. This is a trolley bus in the same underpass. And then this is at the south end of town. This is a totally different line. They're not even connected, so they, they have separate um, uh, bus garages. Uh, this is the uh, new um, line, this, this line here, Tlalan, it's very hard to pronounce, Tlan Tepantia. I only went that far. I didn't go all the way to the north end. Um, they run new Spanish, I think they're CAF trains. Um, they were very, they were only running, I think every 20 minutes or half an hour and they were packed. This is a view from Google, a street level blown up. And what it shows, and I'm trying to show on this is, this is built, it's a brand new electric line and it's built right next to where they had electrified the main line from Mexico City to Querétaro bought new electric equipment, GM locomotives. This was sometime in the 70s. Barely ever used it. Moved these wires out of the way. You see the poles are twisted and whatever. And now only run diesel freight and no passenger service. Here we are back in the station to show the uh, commuter train. And this is a view, again, from Google, a nice sharp one, which shows you how the new line sits right next to the double track freight line and you can see these overhead gantries which once upon a time held a uh, catenary but not for very long. Um, now we're going to jump to Boston. Uh, a few pictures of the Mattapan Ashmont line which still runs PCCs. Oh this is a picture at uh, Ashmont of the, um, the red line. This is one of their uh, older trains this is, here's the PCC with the new air conditioning added to it. Um, and then one of these, yeah, this one, I'm not sure why the driver didn't want his picture taken, but he put his hand up as I was photographing. Uh, this is at the Ashmont end. And there's this new loop uh, that was put in at some point with a totally new station, changed the line used to go down next to where the met, where the subway is, and there was more, much more of a direct connection between them. Now you have to walk to the south end of the uh, subway station and go out to this loop. Um, this is one of their newer cars on the uh, red line. Um, I'm going to take a very short break here, if you don't mind. I'll be right back.
Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Um, as, as, as this uh, slideshow has been announced, it's a little bit of travel all over. This is in Turkey, in the town of Kayseri in central Turkey. They have one light rail line uh, that runs, um, I can't remember the, uh, and it runs from, you can actually see it on the, on the uh, open streets map. It goes from here and then through the center of town and out the other side is the airport where I flew into. Um, these are, this is the, what's really beautiful about Kaiseli, it is next to a 12,000 foot high snowy mountain and with uh, skiing on it. Um, this is a brand new mosque being built when I was there. Um, this is just outside of town. Uh, when I arrived in Kaiseri, I actually went to a part of Cappadocia to do non-rail tourism. And I came to this uh, railway crossing and a freight was coming along. This gentleman to this day is a, has to manually open and close the crossing gates for the highway. Uh, these look like General Motors uh, diesels, but I'm not sure what type because there's some sort of export model. Quite a long freight train. Very near here is the new high-speed line, which is not, does not have a grade crossing. So here we are in Kai City. This is where the light rail goes through town. Then it becomes side of the road here on a beautiful grass median looking very much like New Orleans with a big station here in front of the mosque. And this is the, um, the typical large uh, bazaar type building that they have in Turkey. And I, took, I was able to take some good pictures from above. The Hilton Hotel is across the street here. So uh, here we are. These are the, um, it's a very common light rail car and I'm just blanking on them. The Lyon has these, Kai City. Well, uh, Bob, can you help me? These are not, are these the Serio cars? Hello? Are people hearing me? I think these? so, I, yes, yes, no, they're hearing you. So okay. I'm not sure, but uh, people, yes, uh, Jack May, who definitely knows, has been to Turkey, said they are Serio cars. Yeah, they're Serio cars, yeah. They're, 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 a, they're a, quite a common car that many, many light rail systems use. And which city is this again? Kai, Kai City in central Turkey. Kai City, it's, Kai oh, City. central Turkey, okay. Central Turkey, yes. Got you. Okay. Um, when I was driving back into town, it was raining. I took this picture from my rent-a-car, but then it cleared up and got very sunny. And they have really nice, you can see the flower, the plantings around the, uh, the trolley line. Um, this is the, the main mosque here. As I said, with the green, um, what we what they would call neutral ground in uh, in New Orleans, and this is one of the advantages of digital cameras. This is a picture, and then you can tell it to take multiple frames, so it looks like sort of like a miniature movie. So it's coming. There's the tram coming towards you, um, and look at the the pavement is really nicely done. Very, very well maintained line. This is the view from the Hilton across to the station, which is down here. There's the main mosque and the bazaar, whatever. It's like a giant covered shopping mall that's behind the, uh, the mosque. But even though they have a light rail line, you'll notice a, how much traffic they have and how many buses, uh, I guess, to cover all the rest of the uh, parts of the city. I think it's a, it's a fairly large industrial city of possibly as many as a million people. I don't remember. It's, it's, it's the jumping off point, if anybody knows, in Cappadocia for the, um, the famous, there, it's a national park with these incredible formations out of um, the, these sort of, and um, also there were churches that were built into these formations and they're sort of underground. That's what I, that was my main purpose for visiting that area. And here we are, this is around sunset. You see the lighting um, on the, the castle walls and there's the, uh, the trolley line, very busy. Uh, very, this is sunset from, from the, that's the stadium in the distance, the soccer stadium. 
here we are flying out of Kai City, and there's a very nice close-up view of uh, Mount Erzisch. And now we're in Vienna. Uh, this is the airport station in Vienna underground. Um, they have this special service called City Airport Train. It uses regular double-decker commuter type equipment. The only thing special about it is it runs nonstop from here to Landstrasse sta Station. It saves about 10 minutes versus taking a regular regional train, but costs double and is not included in any of the rail passes. So I never bothered to ride it. I just took the regional, got my multi-day ticket. Um, so this is, this is a, uh, a rail jet is an intercity train. This is the end of the line. This train, I believe, was then going through Vienna and off west towards uh, Munich. This is their first class equipment. And then you have, um, yeah, first. By the way, if you notice, some of the pictures are full widescreen and some of them are in normal four by three. The full widescreen pictures are usually ones I've taken with my uh, phone camera as opposed to my actual uh, digital camera. This is the regular uh, city, as I said, city jest. This is the regular regional train, our Flughafen right up here. Makes a few more stops than the, uh, than the other train. Basically the same equipment. And it's two of them coupled together. So you can see it's a, it's a sort of an art, uh, a fixed set of three cars and then another three. So this was an overall map of Vienna because uh, when we did the pre preview show, I got some questions. This is the Ringstrasse which is surrounding the old part of town. There's the cathedral right in the middle. This is where the opera house is. You can see a lot of tram lines in Vienna that go everywhere, um, radiate out. The pictures I'm gonna to show today of Vienna are mostly in the rail, uh, the, the uh, trolley museum, which is over here in the corner, if you can see my, and they even give you a pretty good track layout of the museum and the buildings on the open on the open streets map. This is the end of the line 18 uh, regular service, as well as the U-Bahn stop, which is here as well underground. So it's not a, not a long walk to get to the, uh, the museum. This is when you enter the museum. This is what you first see. Um, these are you know fairly new cars, really old ones. Service equipment, the occasional bus, and these are um, single bogey, so just two axle cars like this type, which were in service not all that long ago. This was in service a very long time ago. They have a horse car from very early days. This was a standard type car um, before and after Second World War. And then for us, Vienna had uh, bought some Third Avenue Railway cars, and here they are in the museum, former uh, New York cars. They only ran them, I believe, on one or two lines that were rather suburban, where, the, uh, where they had the clearance to run cars that were wider than European standard. Another, they have two or two of them in the museum. And this one was taken with the phone. You'll notice that the pictures taken with the camera, to me, have a more natural color. This looks somewhat, it's bright, but it's a little uh, washed out in my view. But that, but you, you can control your phone camera as well. It's just not as easy to do. Um, I love the name for this one called the Woodworm, it's this car. The next one. They have good English and German signs for almost every uh, piece of equipment in the museum. And then this is, see these were built in 1956, 55, but they were sort of rebuilt. So new skin, but older equipment. As I say, these were, I remember these were in service maybe 
not much longer than 10, 15 years ago when I was first in Vienna, these, this type of, or very similar cars were still running. The neat model to show you how the inside of these cars are laid out. Um, this is the type K car built around 1912. And these were all, uh, these were long gone by, by our time. Of the way in and out. And here we go. This was, um, yeah, there used to be an interurban railway to Bratislava that opened in 19. It's not there anymore. These are pictures in the museum of, uh, of what that service looked like. Uh, this is a freight trolley running down the streets of Vienna. And uh, so they were used and then potato transport. And they actually have one of them in the museum like this. That would, uh, an, open, an open sort of gondola type car pulled by a trolley. Um, we go the, and this is interesting where they show you the different kinds of rail that have been used over time. Um, here is the more, the typical, um, type of rail used in streets, the, uh, the girder rail, of different weight. And this is a car on which it's uh, sitting. It's uh, like a flatbed where, it, where it's being transported. This was for the blackout in 1940. They put uh, tinted windows on their trolleys. Schaffnerlos, uh, for those people who've been to Vienna, you'll know means conductorless. So this was uh, when they were introducing the, um, the, uh, the proof of payment. Way. Now these cars I do remember because G2, the, the number, the lettered uh, lines in Vienna that had a little two suffix uh, ran just outside of the ring and they partly used a tunnel that then became part of one of the U-Bahn networks. Um, this is a, this pretty much explains what these were. The adolescent, this. The J is the line still in operation today. Otakringerstrasse, that's out on the west side of town. And here is a what looks like a two rooms and a bath arrangement, the same type of front and a suspended middle section. And, and then there's a very similar car to that. This is the, um, some sort of a car for hauling equipment, I guess. There it is, very similar, but just, an art, just articulated, no middle section on this one. And I'm not sure if the Viennese called them like they did in Pittsburgh. This would, uh, would we call this a flying fraction? And again, this is the picture taken with the phone camera of the same equipment. These I remember riding as well the first time I was in Vienna on the, um, what was called the Stadtbahn. And again, this has been absorbed and modernized and in, is now part of the, uh, the U-Bahn uh, underground subway metro system. Andrew, interesting yeah. fact about the the Stadtbahn is that it opened in 1897 and it opened as steam and it was not electrified until like 1921, 1922. So it must have been the last operating urban uh, steam railway. Yeah, the other thing I remember about the Stadtbahn is I think the Stadtbahn used left hand running. And yes, they to, yeah. and they had to flip it over to right-hand running where they when they upgraded it to subway. That's right. Yep. Yep. These are the older. This, this these ones I did not see running. This is an older set of the same thing, the WD, and they ran in. Um, they had like a WD and they had a DW for running in the opposite direction. This is just uh, something in the museum showing the. Uh, opening of the first subway in 1978, which I guess would have been the U1, the one that runs north-south through the center of the city. 
I first visited Vienna in 80, 1980, so two years after the first subway opened. Oh yeah, this is another thing. Um, Austria, I know Hungary as well, drove on the left, um, English style, until Hitler basically reversed anything that he uh, took over, reversed it to driving on the right. So in, they had to uh, remind people while they were switching all the streets. My father told me the story that in Budapest, Budapest was the last to be switched. So there were like literally crossovers coming into the city from the countryside where everybody had to switch sides until they, they you know, changed all the traffic lights and moved everything over to right hand side. Um, this is, yeah, advertising to remember to drive on the, uh, the right hand side. I guess they had to switch the streetcar system too. Um, yeah, this it says the type G was the commonest type of tram car with 520 of them. That's a, that's a lot. This, I like these, this looks like this was an addition later. In other words, it looks like this was an open car until they decided to enclose the motorman's cab. Um, this is uh, one of those um, Stadtbahn cars uh, as a, a work unit. And they have one steam dummy in the museum as well. Now we're back on the streets. I have a few pictures on the, of the street system in Vienna. This is the uh, Lokalbahn, or we would call it interurban to Baden, which is another town about 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers south of Vienna. It's sort of a, uh, it's a hot springs resort. This is a combination of two kinds of cars that they couple together. This is a, um, a low floor section and the, the older, the modern all high floor car. This is on the Ringstrasse where the, uh, the street cars are gutter running. Um, line two is one of the ones that loops around the city and then goes off towards the north. Very hard to take a picture here without some kind of cars or people in the way. Um, in front of the opera house. And these are the more modern Bombardier all low floor cars. Um, here we are again with a city jet. This is a um, one of these commuter trains, the same kind that brought me in from the airport. This is on line S50, which makes a loop from the Westbahn and then goes, turns north and around the city on a, a sort of an outer ring railway. The Westbahn Hof used to be the main railroad station in Vienna for anything coming from going west of Vienna, so towards Salzburg, Munich, Germany, wherever. It is now reduced to almost only commuter or uh, regional service since they built a very long tunnel under the city and totally reconfigured where they had two other railroad stations that were uh, not connected to each other, but next to each other. And they've now built something called the Hauptbahnhof, um, which has completely changed the whole way that the uh, system works in Vienna. Westbahn, is, again, is, is some sort of a local commuter service from the Westbahn. This is it. again, typical of the, the style with the double-decker uh, equipment, which is very common all over Europe. This is the inside of the Westbahn, uh, at the upper level where there's some restaurants, but it's far less used than it once was. Um, this is on the line 18 near in front of the, uh, the, the Westbahn. Uh, this is one of their newer Bombardier cars. Almost all of Vienna has been converted to this low floor uh, modern cars, but they still have some older ones running, um, which you'll see in a minute. They run online on, on the 52 and the 60. These older all high floor Duvag cars, I think they're from, from the 80s. These were, I think these were the last of the high floor cars built for Vienna. That is the end of the first section of my show. I need to switch now to part two. Part two is my trip in 20 in, um, 
September of this last year to Colorado. Um, uh, you know, I flew into Denver. So here's a layout of the Denver airport, which is immense. I'd, I'd actually not been to, to Colorado in over 20 years. So this is the first time I saw the new Denver airport. Last time I'd flown in, I still flew into Stapleton. Um, this is their um, high level rail that goes right into the middle here between the two sections. Um, and here we are. This is taken with the phone. I have a special ultra wide angle camera on the phone, which is not quite fisheye, but distorts a little bit around the corners, but it is, it is an ultra wide angle. Um, this is, I don't know if they call it a silver liner, but it's basically the same type of equipment as SEPTA runs now. Uh, I think Korean, Rotem, Korean built. Um, some of them are wrapped, as you can see, fly the friendly skies in a weird sort of Anglo-German. And then this is downtown Denver. Now, this has changed immensely from what it used to be. This is all new development. This was what this was all once upon a time railroad yards. So what you have going to Union Station is now a dead end set of tracks, a few tracks for Amtrak and the a high level uh, A line of the, um, the electrified commuter line. Over here behind it is the light rail coming in, uh, two or three of the light rail lines. This is connected underground and there's buses that go in a tunnel here on either side of this underground connection. And then this is the main freight line going, still running through town. I put in a picture to show what this used to look like just about 1970s, it was all railroad yards. And I do remember it because I remember I rode the Rio Grande Zephyr and I was in Denver many years ago. This was, this is, you know, it's all condos and houses and restaurants and totally redeveloped. So here we are at Union Station. There's still the old Union Station, but this is all that new complex where the uh, commuter rail line comes in. Here's another one in the United wrapped United Airlines. Then on the street, this is the L line on uh, at 16th and Stout. This is the only one of the lines that runs single unit cars. All the other light rail lines in Denver run two to three of these uh, Siemens cars coupled together. Uh, here we are again at night, same location. But this is much more typical of the service where they couple two and three cars together. By the way, this building above it is it's not, it's not an office building, that's a parking garage. You'll notice there's actually no windows in those, uh, in those frames. And you'll get these weird lash ups of regular cars and then wrapped cars all coupled together. Here we are again. The, the line with single, just the, with single units. This is the new bridge over where there used to be. This is still here, the facilities for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. This is one of the high, high floor LR, uh, you know, uh, whatever. They're not, it's not really a subway, it's a commuter, electrified commuter line. This is the other one, which just opened since I was there, but I, I could already see it. I'm, can't remember, they're all lettered. So I have some pictures. This is the new line that was not yet open when I was there in September. I didn't see anything test, test running on it either. Um, this is looking down into the railway yard where we still have one BNSF in tradition in the old uh, war bonnet scheme and then one in the old freight yellow and blue and all these other newer colors. Here we are looking at the this is the line that goes to um, Arvada Ridge and I uh, can't remember the name of the last station. But anyway, this is, and then you can see the foothills of Colorado in the distance. Uh, here it is coming over this bridge over the, the railroad yard. And then as it turns towards Union Station. And again, some of the cars completely wrapped. Notice all these new condos everywhere you know, one going up in the background, 
totally changed from its old industrial railway use. This is on the south side of downtown. This is the light rail, which goes under the convention center and then goes next to Colfax, which is the main east-west street in Denver, makes a sharp turn under it and then goes south and then splits into two lines farther south. This way, going to the left, it goes to that back side of Union Station. And there's one line that comes out of Union Station in the back that is only accessible from there, goes this way, and also goes west all the way to Golden. Uh, this is from Google that shows you, here's the line that goes to Golden. It's in kind of light color. And then these are the ones going to Littleton down here. Andrew Grawl showed us pictures of the line going off this way to the um, extreme south uh, east. Uh, one of his shows quite recently. Uh, I stopped for lunch to have elk, believe it or not. That is an elk steak. In a restaurant, it's claimed to be the oldest steakhouse in Colorado, and it's practically across the street from this LRT station. So I, I was using public transit in Denver for about a day. Here's a tenth of Osage. And then this is that station that's on the back side of Union Station, the end of two of the light rail lines. Over here, you can see the freight railroad line right behind it. These are taken from these nice pedestrian overpasses. Very easy to get pictures. And along came a very long empty coal train going north. And one coal train and another empty coal train right beside it. Still a very busy uh, north-south rail line. Uh, on my way back into Denver, it was a 10-day trip. Um, I stopped at Littleton at the end of this light rail to take some more pictures. And here we are again. I was really lucky to get one train completely free of wrapping and advertising. Uh, this is on my last day on, in Denver before I went to the airport at Arvada Ridge, which is the second to last stop on this line that goes west. Uh, and here are some more of these uh, silver liner type trains coming in. Fortunately, because of the high platform, you can't really get a picture of the whole car. And here it is coming in on the other side. Um, and again, one of these places where there's all new transit oriented development going on because it's so, uh, now that they have public transit, um, people want to live near it and use it. All right, I'm going to make a short pause here for everybody to take a, before we go. Now we're going off of electric railways for a little bit. Uh, so if everybody wants to take a little bit of a breather or have any questions, I'll be right back. I'll take this opportunity for those who are late comers to make an announcement. The next meeting in September will be Friday, September 25th, which is the fourth Friday, not the third Friday. Make a note of that. Um, the other announcement for those who came on late is for 2021, assuming a hotel opens, January, March, May, September, and November will be the hotel meetings and the other months, February, April, June, uh, June, October, and December will be Zoom meetings. But regardless of the meeting source, every meeting will be recorded and posted on the website. 
Yes, 7.30, Friday, September 25th, not September 18th, it's a Jewish holiday. September 25th will be the uh, meeting, then we'll go back to the third, we will go back to the third Friday of the month for the balance of the year. Um, other reminder for people who are new uh, and from other clubs other than ERA, we invite you to join as members. You can go to erausa.org on the website and you can join, uh, put your credit card in and join right then and there. And uh, our webmaster, Sandy Campbell, has now made a new donation website. As I mentioned at the opening of the meeting, our revenues, uh, our expenses exceed revenues by about 40,000 each year. We're good for the years 2021, 2022, uh, but I don't know that we'll make it beyond 2023. You can go to the erausa.org uh, website and uh, you can look for the new button to donate. All donations are appreciated. And I assume no, Andrew's not back yet. Ah, very yeah, good. Okay, I, I, Andrew. I, I heard you. I just I was letting you. Uh, okay, back yeah. to you. <laughs> okay, I put this map up because my other my interest in Colorado is the many many narrow gauge lines that used to be there, of which only two remain, and they're tourist services. Um, this is a map I believe it's like, I think it's from eighteen very late eighteen nineties. Um, this was the system, and you can actually see on here not just what was the Rio Grande system, but for example, this line, if you can follow my mouse, going this way and across here is what was known as the Denver South Park and Pacific, which was also a narrow gauge line. So I was in Colorado besides to see Denver again. I went to visit to make, take four rail trips. Um, two of them down here, one in Alamosa over to Levada Pass, that's now called the Rio Grande Scenic Railway. It actually goes over this railroad, although Levada Pass was relocated in the tens by the Rio Grande when they upgraded it from narrow to standard gauge. This line was the second trip. The first trip I took was from Antonito to here on the narrow gauge, but there I had run out of from Chama to Ozier and back 10 years ago. So I'd seen the West End. This is now called the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic. So the two parts of the narrow gauge that still exists are Antonito to Chama and Durango to Silverton. Uh, the rest is all gone. Some of the, this, the rest of this railroad is standard gauge is in place. Um, this, the North South line certainly they built the Moffat Tunnel through here so they don't have to run the, the long way, but most of this line past Canyon City is mothballed. Um, the section here through the Royal Gorge was the last train trip I took that. You'll see there's a very beautiful scenic train ride out of Canyon City into the Royal Gorge and back. Um, and then there's the, so that's basically one, two, three, four trips that I took on this. So driving out of Denver, the road actually follows this way through Kenosha Pass, down this way, and then you drive down to Alamosa. This is one of the straightest tracks ever built in the US and the road next to it, which is there now today, is also straight. There's not a curve on it for 40 miles or something. So um, the other part that I drove, which is interesting is the road here in Colorado, US 50, which goes from Montrose through Gunnison and then goes over Monarch Pass to Salida. The road here, the railroad, which has gone since 1955, which goes over Marshall Pass, which is slightly lower, and the railroad never had a grade over 4%, is a very well graded, very scenic gravel road that can be driven by a regular car. And I decided to do that on the way back. By You'll see some pictures on Monarch Pass, I mean on Marshall Pass. So here we are leaving Denver to Alamosa. We're pretty much following the railroad rights away. I had to make this detour, not intentionally. This road was under construction. When we got here, there was a sign that says you have to go this way. 
Um, when of this, the once upon a time, all of this was built for mining country. Leadville is not shown on the map, it's about there. That was one of the big mining centers that caused all these railroads. This is coming over Kenosha Pass. I stopped for a quick view and this bird, this is done with a slight telephoto, but mountain bluebird and he was very, didn't fly away. So I got a really, really good picture. This is the narrow gauge from Antonito. Um, you can actually see this thin gray line how twisty and windy it is to get over the mountains. The Toltec Gorge, then it goes over Combres Pass, which is about there, and down to Chama. That is the 67 miles of narrow gauge railroads still run with steam, as it was since 1890. This is, these are pictures from 10 years ago on the west end, going up on the west side. This is in the there's a parlor car at the back end with an open observation platform. We were double headed up that side because the climb to Cumbres Pass is 4% grade. And we had a very long train and they needed to, to double head us up the hill. A Andrew, I don't know if you covered this as a question. When did the narrow gauge railroad quit running to Denver? I'm not sure to, Den to Denver, they first multi-gauged it. Uh -huh. so it was running as dual gauge in the late 1890s. They lifted out the narrow gauge to Denver, I think by close to the turn of the century or early into the 20th. Okay. So the narrow gauge was reduced to running basically from Salida and Alamosa only. The main line through the Royal Gorge, mm -hmm. the main line north-south were standard gauge and you had to transfer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then this is going around a very famous place called Windy Point um, as we were going uphill. Um, there we are. And here's an interesting, at the top of the pass at the Cumbre Station, they still put the board up of when the last actual passenger train went by. The railroad was only shut down in 68. It really lasted as a steam railroad until it was abandoned in 66 or 68 and then the two states new mexico and colorado bought up this this fairly long section of 64 miles and has contracted out operation to different groups over time so this is what's running now to the they now just call it the colorado express so it runs every day in the summer um, it's not kept open in winter because the snow can be 20 feet deep on the mountain pass this is this year. This is at the, um, the Antonito end. Um, the, almost all the locomotives that are still in service to this day are from a group called the K36s. Um, there's one K37, which is in operation at the Colorado Railroad Museum, and one of them has just recently been turned into an oil burner on the Durango and Silverton. Um, but all the other ones are K36. There's a slight difference between the two. The 37s were slightly more powerful, but for some reason, the tourist railroads all run the 36s. Um, this is the parlor car. Uh, and I was very lucky on this trip. Behind the parlor car, there was a newly rebuilt caboose, which has been rebuilt to be this sort of private car and one of the railroad commissioners with his wife was the only person riding it and invited me to join them. So I was able to climb up into the cupola and take pictures from up here as we went up to Osier. So it was, only, it was really a lot of fun rather than just having to ride in the parlor car. You'll notice there's an open car as well for people to ride. Um, these cars are, are actually rebuilds. The Cumbres and Toltec did not have any passenger equipment. In 68, when the railroad shut down, because there had been no passenger service here since 1951, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of freight equipment, there were steam engines, there was no passenger cars, so they actually had to build replicas. The other line, the Silverton line, had the passenger equipment and still has it. This is, the scenery here is really quite spectacular as you go up the hill. This is going through mud tunnel. There are two tunnels on this end. There's no tunnels on the, the west end. The east end has mud tunnel. Then we go up this curve. Notice how sunny it is. 
by the time we got around the curve and I got a picture of the train, it got cloudy. But you see how long the train is. Um, and then this is going, uh, just coming out of rock tunnel, um, or just going into rock tunnel, I should say, because the train, I mean, the caboose. Um, as soon as you go through this tunnel and you come out the other side, you're in Toltec Gorge, where there's sheer drops from the edge of where the train is. This is later on as we're climbing up the hill, it gets a little less, um, you know, there's not as much uh, rocky scenery, but there's a lot of coal smoke. This is Ozier, the station where the train stops for lunch. You can either go halfway and go back, you can go all the way to the other end and uh, they can take you back by bus. It's much faster, the bus ride is an hour and a half versus this, the train never goes much over 15 miles an hour. Um, but I decided, because I'd, rid I'd ridden the other end halfway and back, that I was going to ride it halfway and back this time. So here's the locomotive pulling us back. This is where we have lunch. This is a new building they built for concessions, a uh, restaurant. So there's the caboose that I was in. Uh, it was on a deadhead move. They were taking it to the other end of the line. This was actually built in Colorado Springs. Uh, the railroad museum there uh, rebuilds cars for this railroad. And these little speeders follow the steam engines because of the cinders that the steam engines uh, throw out uh, in case there are fires in the, and uh, yeah, they, this is now, I'm now on the platform on the back end of the parlor car looking into the tunnel. This is the, uh, the rock tunnel and then scenery going back towards Antonito. This is mud tunnel again. Here we are, much shorter. And this one had to be braced. And these are the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which is, they're very high. A lot of these are 13 to 14,000 foot high mountains. Here we are at the station in Antonito. There's the, the drum head to make it look like the original, the San Juan is when it's and here's just another map to show you the, although this is La Beta Pass. This is, Alamosa is off the map on the left. It's quite flat leaving Alamosa. The train picks up some additional passengers at Fort Garland and then goes over this windy, windy route to La Beta. The original narrow gauge when it was went kind of like this, it went a different way. Um, it was much steeper. And when they decided to rebuild the line, as I say around 1910, they lowered the grade, but made it uh, fairly twisty. This was on my way the day before when I'm going to Antonito from Alamosa, I passed the freight train that's run by the short line company that also operates the passenger service. Um, you'll notice this is a, a this is a, a, I think it's an F, FP40, but behind it is an E8, but it's lost its portholes. Um, this is, you know, a classic, a diesel from the late 40s. They were built into the 50s for passenger service. This, the yard in Alamosa is full of equipment that needs to be refurbished. This is a three quarter length dome from the Southern Pacific. Um, they had all sorts of equipment. They had short domes from the Burlington. They're just parked all over this yard. Um, in the meantime, this railroad has gone into receivership and the passenger service is not operating right now. I was lucky in September that they were still running. Um, so here we are inside a dome car. Uh, this one I believe is an ex Santa Fe uh, full length dome. They've been converted into these sort of dining areas. The, the originally they were coach arrangement. Breakfast, they, they actually cook on the train. They have a real kitchen. It's like a dump. It's underneath the dome, and they have an, an and they actually have a full dining car on it, which they were not using for seating, but they were using the kitchen. This is the other dome car, different upholstery, but uh, also arranged for dining. This is the dining car. This is a New York Central car built by Bud in the fifties. Um, you know, operated on the the Great Steel Fleet. They have a few tables set up to look like dining equipment. This is people have been moving around. So the train wasn't quite full, but it was it was quite well attended. Um, 
this is the observation car at the back end. This is from the Illinois Central. It is a, an observation car, I believe, off either the Panama Limited or the city of New Orleans. Uh, there's a bar section in the middle, which is open. There's a bartender. Beautiful woodwork where the magazine stand is. And then this is the observation end, the round end of the very well restored or maintained from its original build in the 50s. Again, cooking underneath, making French toast for breakfast. And then they have one open car at the end. This is actually what was a closed car. They've taken the windows out of it. It has an open platform at the end. Like this is a much older car than from the Streamline era. You can see the E8 up front. The train does not turn around. So in one direction, the locomotive is in front of you on the, you know, for the uh, open platform in the other direction, it's in front of the observation car. They actually switched the locomotives uh, on us. They took off the passenger E8 and this one and gave us a much larger freight engine to pull us over the hill. There it is. And these are the, the, um, the five cars, the two dome cars, the observation at the back end, the dining car in the middle and this open, what was a closed car at one time with an observation platform. They actually take, they actually make a stop at the top of the mountain and they actually back the train down and have a run pass like it was for rail, like rail fan trips. And I do have a video of it coming back up the hill. This is on the way back when the engine's on the other end, when you can actually, you know, stand on the back platform and look out. Here we are going through one of the tunnels, uh, going back to Alamosa. They stopped for about an hour, an hour and a half in Levada. You have time to, although we've, we've eaten on the train, uh, it's time to get ice cream or whatever else you want. <laughs> Go shopping. Here we are going through the tunnel. Here's the view. Um, very, it was a very clear day. I was very lucky the entire trip in Colorado. I had basically very nice, very temperate summer days. Um, here we are again inside the dome car. And then I drove from Alamosa. I stayed overnight in Monte Vista. I went to a bird sanctuary here and then I drove over this way towards Durango. Now the railroad used, still runs to South Fork, but they don't run much service beyond Monte Vista. The railroad actually runs as a freight service to Monte Vista. And then there's a large agricultural area here. There's another railroad. There, you see a lot of hopper cars, other things. This, Railroad used to run up to Creed to the, um, it was a mining town. That has, that service hasn't run in about 20 years. The tracks are still in place. So anyway, I drove this way to Chimney Rock and then on to Durango. Down here where I continued at Arbelez, you see where, um, here's Antonito and on the bottom here, you can't see it, this Chama. So the railroad, the narrow gauge used to go through Chama and then come back and go this way, Arbelez, and into Durango. This dam, which was built in the late 50s, they actually had to relocate the narrow gauge railroad here. They had to build it a new right of way because it would have been flooded. There's a new steel bridge there. The bridge is still in place, um, but you know the, the federal government paid money near the end of the life of the narrow gauge to relocate it. By then it was already disappearing. This is right along that railroad. I'm driving through South Fork and I don't know how this got here, why it's here. It's a seaboard coastline observation car boarded up with steel plates over the windows. Is it some rail fan group wants to resurrect service here? I don't know, but it's, you know, they've at least protected it from rotting away. So then I drove more or less where the railroad used to be into Durango. That evening, I took some pictures of the Durango and Silverton coming into town. They run three trains a day in the summer. They're that busy. Um, this is one of Durango's major tourist draws where they, so for people to ride this railroad. This railroad never went out of business. The railroad ran, actually ran the passenger service here through the 50s into the 60s. Sometime it was the early 80s when they sold it off to a separate company. They didn't really, didn't really fit the model. It was an isolated line for them. So 
it's been run as a tourist service now exclusively. And here, this car is a rebuild. The Rio Grande Railroad had built an open car like this in the late 40s and it burned in the 50s. So a few years ago, this railroad rebuilt two of these. This is the, uh, the original Silver Vista, it's still called Silver Vista. I was going to ride it on the way back. And instead of doing that, I came back on one train earlier on the parlor car. This is a parlor car. This is a very famous one. It's in one of the Colorado annuals. This was originally a paymaster car built in sometime in the late 1880s. It's been converted over the years and uh, it even has a sleeper section, believe it or not. And it is, it was, um, they use it, uh, they have one other one called the Nomad, two of these. So this is the section that's open. I was told there's no actual bedding up here, but these are like sections. They fold it down and you know, the, the seats slid together and it became a sleeper. So this is uh, one of the scenic spots called Rockwood. The railroad out of Durango doesn't quite follow the road, but then it really splits off. You can't see, this is way above the river. This is the famous viewpoint, which you'll see in a minute. And then as it follows the river, it eventually, as it goes uphill, it gets down to river depth into the canyon. But at this point, it's way up above the river like this. This is a very famous curve that's on all the postcards and the views of this, this line. This is up at Silverton. They do have a, um, a diesel switcher up here. These are one of these little speeders that follows the, the train when uh, to put out fires. Here's Silver Vista. It's open on the sides and has a glass top. They don't use it obviously only in the summer because this railroad does operate through the winter season on a limited basis. This is what it looks like. There was a guy while he was in Silverton for an hour or two, he comes through and actually washes the windows. This is the cut near uh, Rockwood. Uh, this is coming back. Uh, as you come, you to get the pictures I took a day later, I actually walked through here which you will see in a minute that I drove from Durango to that spot. And here's the end of the train, the Silver Vista going from the viewpoint. This is the, the reason I only have the back end of the train on photographs is because I was taking videos of it while it was going by. And I, if I have time, I'll show them at the end of the show. Then I drove from there to Silverton and then from Silverton to Ridgeway. Ridgeway has a tiny railroad museum uh, to preserve the Rio Grande Southern, which used to go all the way around. There was this giant, they could never build a railroad from about here uh, to there. Uh, it went up to a place called Ironton. They had a railroad out of Silverton, but then this gets very steep and there's a huge elevation change. Uh, it's called the Million Dollar Highway when they put it in in the 30s. Um, finally so they could connect the two, but there was no way they could build a railroad through here. So the, the only connection from Durango to this part was this huge detour. And this went out in 1952, I believe. So somebody rebuilt the first of the motor cars that was built in 31 by this railroad. It's been rebuilt and sits here. And I, I know it runs because I've seen pictures of it. Sometimes they take it away from this museum and actually run it. Um, they're rebuilding this coach from 1880 over here. There's not much to this museum. There was nobody around. It's just open to the elements except for this roof. Um, then I went through Montrose. I went up into Black Canyon of the Venison National Park. Very well worth it. I didn't put pictures in of that. That's a whole, that would be a whole separate show. Uh, then from there, there's a little detour here. As I showed earlier on the map, the narrow gauge used to run through here, but it went out in, uh, by 1955, it was gone. And since they built these dams here, it would be underwater anyway. So what they did leave at this point, right there on the map is this. This, this is a picture of a, train, of a train crossing the bridge. They have left the bridge in place and the National Park Service has placed this locomotive on the bridge 
built in 1882 in Philadelphia by Baldwin, and a boxcar and a caboose. So the bridge is totally authentic. It was here, but it's disconnected from anything else, and it's used only as sort of a, 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 a diorama. And then the next thing I did was from the hotel I stayed at up here in the mountains, I drove around across, and this spot is Curacante Needle, which for anyone who's a fan of the Rio Grande Railroad will recognize as it was the symbol of the railroad for many years, scenic line of the world. This is the view from above, where once upon a, there it is again, but you see where the railroad would have been is underwater under a dam. Inside the Colorado Railroad Museum are two pictures that show you what the railroad looked like probably in the 30s and what it would look like now. So even if they'd kept this narrow gauge line, it would be underwater. Um, then I drove over Marshall Pass, the east side. This is the road, as I said, goes or Monarch Pass. The railroad used to go over and the gravel road is on the railroad right of way. So here we are. This is the very twisty road all the way. It's, it's in very good shape. This is still there. The water tank at Sargent's never been removed. And this is the road going up. It's been what's wider than the railroad, but it follows the actual railroad grade. Fall Aspens, here we are at Marshall Pass, 10,842 feet above sea level. Here's the road. Mount Ure is only a mile away from this point, this mountain. It would only be about a mile. There's the railroad right away that you're driving on and then going downhill towards the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. This was a, a trip that people took when people re rode railroads It was, and tourists went that way. It was a significant tourist draw for Colorado back then. Um, this is the drive from Salida to Canyon City to show you that the railroad still exists along here and this is the Royal Gorge. The road could, the, doesn't fit into Royal Gorge. And uh, so the road, the road goes much higher up and then has to come down a long hill into Canyon City. Here's the railroad through the gorge. This shows you there's an aerial tramway here as well as what was once the world's highest bridge crossing the gorge. And this no longer exists. This was a little elevator incline that I remember when I did drive here 20 years ago or so, I actually took this incline railway down into the gorge, but it's, it went out, it's not, it burned with some kind of fire and they never rebuilt it. So this railroad, the Rio Grande, um, the scenic railroad into the Royal Gorge, I think that's a former New Jersey Transit locomotive, a GP40P. And then there's four full length domes on this, this train. This is a dining car that is used as a kitchen. Here's one of the, uh, this is a bud dome. I believe this is from, again, from the Santa Fe. Notice these additional uh, air conditioning units. These two are from the Milwaukee. These are super domes from the Milwaukee road. And they've added these curtains. For, again, it's been converted into a dining type car. So we had a, we had a very nice lunch on this train. There it is, salad, filet mignon, dessert. And then we go into the canyon and they have one open car in the middle. And this is an interesting shot. This was going into the canyon around before lunch and the same picture coming back the other way, different lighting only about an hour, an hour and a half later. So here's the other, one of the other domes Another one, it's hard to tell, but the window arrangements at the ends, you can see are they're from different cars. See the, this has a different window arrangement than the Milwaukee one over here. Um, this is along the river and what, then we ran into rafters. And again, here we are with the Milwaukee domes. And here's the bridge over the Royal Gorge. And then you can see where the, um, that other little gondola car services. And this is the famous hanging bridge. The hanging bridge is literally a hanging bridge. It's not, 
they had to build it this way. And uh, even the railroad ones hit it, as you can see here, the bent part of it. Um, what, what it is is that the canyon is so narrow at this point that half the track was built on a bridge and only half is on land. So it's a linear bridge, but because they couldn't support the bridge from underneath, they, they built this contraption above and it's held up by these, they're not cables, they're actually steel rods that hold up the bridge. Um, it, was a, it was always a stop uh, in the old days when the passenger trains used to get out here. There was, there's a platform and people could, uh, you know, the, the train would stop for a few minutes. This is another railroad right of way that I drove, which is a gravel road of the Florence and Cripple Creek Railroad, which was another narrow gauge serving mining country. Uh, I drove this many years ago in a much larger car. Again, gravel road without any problems. There's a one lane tunnel, so that you can see through it. And this little marker. And then we, you go over one bridge is left from the days of when this, it hasn't been replaced since by a newer bridge. Very good steel bridge and the road bed has simply been placed on where the railroad track was. Um, then this is Colorado Springs. Uh, this is a former Rock Island roundhouse, which is now the home of the Pikes Peak uh, Railroad Museum. And over here, you'll see a PCC. This is a former Philadelphia car. Here's a thing about the Rock Island. And this car, they were going to run at Colorado Springs and Manitou Traction. There was a plan to put a tourist trolley into Colorado Springs and Manitou Springs never came to fruition. So these cars, the few they have are sitting here in this museum. They run it back and forth over a couple hundred feet of track. That's all they have. And this is a former LA narrow gauge PCC, which they also have one, but you'll see that it's sitting on an extra piece of rail. So they can't run it because they don't have the, uh, and I don't even know if it would run anyway. But there it is, a former LA PCC in Colorado Springs, a former Denver uh, tramways trolley bus. And inside is one of the former Fort Collins Bernies. Fort Collins was the last city in the US to run burn in all of North America to run Bernie cars uh, shut down in 1951. And they actually have, I've been there they rebuilt part of the line and they have two Bernies up there running on a re re rebuilt section of the original trolley. Here it is on the inside, nicely maintained. Uh, then I drove back to Denver and stopped to there are a few pictures of Diesel's big coal train. This line is a major coal route, I believe between the Wyoming coal fields and Texas. And then I went to get a picture of the California Zephyr, the Amtrak train leaving Denver, and then ended at the Colorado Railroad Museum, which pictures I'm gonna defer for another time. So here's the California Zephyr coming up the hill. Here's what is today the closest you get to a dome car. It's a double-decker car with some glass, but you can't see forward only up the side. Anyway, that's the end of the Colorado section. And what time are we at? Okay, we still have, I think I'll be able to get through the last part. You're fine, go, go ahead. All right, I'll go into section three and then I actually created a bonus section if people wanna hang around, it's not very long. I have yep. to find, where is my section three? Hold on, that's four, uh, ERA, why is it I can't see? Okay, that? so while you're doing that, I'm gonna make one other announcement, so. Okay. We are fortunate in that uh, we are drawing people from Australia, North America, and Europe. And uh, if any of you do have ideas for presentations that you would like to make to the group, uh, please let me know. I will put my email in the chat. Uh, the submissions are subject to screening. We have a program chairman is Andrew Grawl, who's uh, online here, but I would forward that to him. He's the one who sets up the programming. But if you have an idea for a presentation, they are usually hour and a half, two hours, uh, 
please feel free to let me know. And uh, I'm going to reshare in a minute. I'm looking for what happened to my part three. Okay, no problem. It's right here. So where is it? <laughs> Hold on. Take your time. Uh, While you're doing that, we had a high attendance of the 94 was the highest. So almost as high as last time. But, well, last time we went over 100. It was 118, but that was like really. This is August, and people are somehow finding a way to get away. So for August, this is spectacular. Something is weird because I have slideshow three. It's there. And this is not picking it up. I just gotta Did let me just come? exit and restart here. The well, there it is. Slideshow three. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Great. All right. Let me let me just share the. Go ahead. Screen. Okay. Let me go back into sharing. Uh, there. Here. Here we go. Slideshow three. Here we go. Okay, so this is Lisbon. Uh, for trolley fans, Lisbon is heaven. They have a lot of very, very scenic for a city, very hilly trolley lines. They recently restored this line, this line from here, from the Praça uh, Luis de Camões to the north end out here to Campo Lide, had been out of service for many, many years. And it's still, they need to extend it down this way. But for now, it runs two cars alternating. It's not very heavily used and it goes up to here. You'll notice that, notice the track on the track map. If I can show you, notice how it has, uh, I don't know what the, what the right term is, where the curves are so tight that see this curve goes inside of the other track because these streets are very narrow. And here, here there's another one. I know going up the hill here, I've taken pictures in the past where the, where the track going uphill sort of has to swing over, impinge on the track coming downhill and then make the curve. So anyway, I went and wanted to ride and take pictures of the newly restored line 24. So here it is coming up. The, uh, this was, by the way, Lisbon was, I think a year, uh, two years ago, 2018. It had, I think it had just come back into service that year. So here we are on the street. Um, there's people loading. There, there are, these cars are quite old, although they're not as old as they look. They're really rebuilt cars that were shipped to Portugal, I believe as kits. They were built by Brill, but all the electrical equipment is completely new German, keep the modern equipment and the fare system in it is, um, you know, it's like a, a card with a proximity card. But some of them still use trolley poles. Some of them, you'll notice they have a pantograph because on some lines they run on pantograph. This is at the southern end at the Casa Camoish. And then we're gonna go uphill uh, towards Campo Lide. Here we are. I, there seemed to be some kind of fog here. This is the picture that you guys used for the web page. Um, and then here we are for the same location. And then this kid got on the outside and uh, didn't want to pay his fare, so he hung on the outside of the car. Uh, there is a gantlet track going through this archway. As you can see it, you know, overlapping tracks because uh, it's too narrow for the for double track like that. Uh, this is a remnant of an old wall or aqueduct that it comes up next to. Uh, here we are going through that passageway again. And this is this is now a restored, very elegant sort of boutique shopping mall. I'm not, I don't remember what the, it was some kind of a government building, but it's been gutted. It's a, quite a neat building on the inside. This is what the cars look like on the inside. Modern, they are sort of modernized flip over seats, but the old type floor. Um, here's the, the tr this track goes off this way, but it doesn't connect to anything anymore. So there's still the, the point switch is still in the 
then it goes on to this plaza, but there's no nowhere for it to go. This is, um, oh, this is one of the elevate, what they call elevador. This is a, they, Lisbon has four funiculars. And this I think is the Bica, if I remember, I think this is the Bica. Yeah, it's this one. This is the Bica funicular. It's called covered in graffiti. Not always, there's, I showed pictures of the cars, I believe two years ago, and some of them are not, and some of them are. See, it goes through this sort of archway, but the tracks overlap, but of course the cars never meet there. They only meet at the center point. This is at the bottom. This is line 25. It's this, this line operates right, as, this is right at the bottom of the funicular. And a lot of advertising on these cars. Here's line 25 again. This is taken from one car into another as it's going up the hill. Some of these hills in uh, Lisbon are very steep. I'm not sure of the grade, but they are very steep for trolleys. That's, that's, that's quite a hill, isn't it? You can actually see the, the tilt of the car. Um, this is in Sintra. I had been out to Sintra on one of my trips to Portugal close to 10 years ago, and the line was only operating from Sintra down to where the car barn is, and it was only running hourly or hour and a half. It was, it was very rare service, and I had to wait forever to get back. Um, it's still not running very frequent service because this was the month of, I think it was November, and it was only running a few times a day. Yeah, this is November 13th. Um, here we are, they make a stop. This is near the car barn. Um, they let me get, they, they're, they're not in a hurry, so I, they let me get off, take some pictures, get back on the tram. And this is the right of way. It's mostly next to a road. Um, I'm not sure why they need a driver and a conductor, but they do, and then they have these passing sidings. Again, because they don't run very frequent service, I think the trolley at that time of year runs two or three times a day. That's it. Um, so this is at the, the southern end, at the beach end. There was another car already there, an, an older car. It was just parked there, but the trolley pole was up, so I'm assuming it was going to be used. Um, I didn't stay down there because it's a long wait of about an hour and a half till the next service, and I wanted to get back to town. I, it was a nice place to eat, eat down here, but Anyway, these are, these are really nice old cars and they're in there. they are still in everyday service. Um, so here we are going back. Um, car doesn't run very fast because the track is, the track is good, but it's not great. And here we are at the, back at the north end, the guy reversing the poles or taking it down for a while. That was lunch in Sintra. And these are really neat fountains in Sintra, in the central plaza there. This is the commuter line that goes out from uh, Lisbon to Sintra. Um, so I took some pictures of the commuter trains here. There are some double-decker, but there's a, there's a tunnel to get into Sintra. It goes through a short tunnel. Um, a lot of graffiti in Portugal, quite common. Um, right onto the windows, in fact. This is, yeah, this is still the Sintra station. This is getting on the train in Sintra. Look, a lot of graffiti, looking out the window, looking at another train covered in graffiti. This is, I think, uh, this is uh, Campo something. This is a, a transfer station in Lisbon. I then went, I, I changed train here to cross the river to go to the south side. Um, yeah, see, they do have the double-decker. Comboish in uh, Portuguese is commuter train. Uh, Cercanias in Spanish. Um, so this, these trains, this is a fairly busy station. They still have some single-deck cars as well. Again, very graffiti-covered. Um, this one's not. I, like, I love the lighting on this one. These are, this is in... I guess it's in one in the station there. They have these nice tile work. So you're going to Japan. This is the Portuguese were mariners, so they celebrate their, uh, I guess, Magellan and the round the world trips. This is on the south side. This is the uh, Sul de Tejo uh, 
um, light rail, which is much newer. It goes from, uh, it's got three different lines spread around the south side of the river, Taguas, as we call it in English, Tejo in Portuguese. Um, this is at the interchange station with the uh, commuter rail, where some of the trains uh, reverse uh, direction. Here we are in the, with the sun glinting off of it. And then, um, and then I went down to the other end, I rode it down and took a ferry back. This is the terminal at the, at the ferry station. It was much later in the day, so it was dark. This is the, the bridge that the commuter rail goes over this bridge. Um, this bridge was built, I don't know if you can see it on this picture, maybe if I zoom in. Uh, yeah, you'll see how the there's a double set of cables on this bridge. What they did is when this bridge was built, I think in the 60s, it was single deck for cars only. When they decided to put the railroad on it, they had to put another set of cables in to support the extra weight. That's very unusual. Not sure exactly how as an engineering job that was done. They have a sort of a small, smaller version of Rio over here, the, uh, like the Corcovado. There was an aircraft carrier, I'm assuming not Portuguese, but probably American. Um, sunset, as I was taking the ferry back to Lisbon. And when I arrive in Lisbon, you arrive in another commuter line. This is the one that goes to, goes west along the river um, to Belém and farther out. Uh, this is all these stainless steel, uh, nice cars like this. This is, that means out of service. This is a jump to San Jose, California. I don't remember I threw this in because uh, it's a good shot of one of their uh, cars. Oh, and then I had some San Francisco pictures at the end of this trip. This is the yard. I know, I know a lot of members have been to San Francisco many times on trips. Um, this is where they keep the, uh, the F-Line fleet. They keep it in the old, um, it was the Geneva car barn, and this is the modern car barn for the light rail vehicles at Balboa Park. So here's a newer, one of the Breda cars coming in. And here is one of the original, uh, this is one of the Muni cars, not the, yeah, this is one of the original Muni cars. And here we are, this is, um, this is not an original Illinois terminal. It's one of the Muni double NPCCs painted to look like an Illinois terminal, which also had double NPCCs. But I think this is what they call a magic carpet car. It's a little different. They have a Milan Peter Witt. There's the controller. This one was out of service, I think, at the time. Here's another Milan Witt on Market Street in a different color scheme. And yeah, I'm just thinking Peter, Peter Ehrlich didn't show the same picture, so I'm not overlapping with his show from last, last time. This one I think is in the Kansas City uh, paint scheme. And then this is the F line and uh, the ferry building. Oh, here we are, yeah, this is, um, I don't remember which city this is set for, DC Transit. So this is painted up to look like a, Washington PCC. Here's a double-ended car. Uh, this is the, the Illinois Terminal car out. These are taken at different different uh, trips to San Francisco, by the way. Some of them are 2010, some of them are 2012, some of them are 2016. Um, here's a, I think this is a Philadelphia car, right? This is made to look like a Philadelphia car. This is one of their Breda cars going into the tunnel. Uh, on the N line, uh, you can see the wires up here. This is where the F line is on where they meet up. Here's the Breda car coming out of the tunnel. And here's, uh, this is another, I believe this is a Muni car. I'm not sure this was a Muni car or an original Market Street car, but I think it's a Muni. And here's another double end car made to look like uh, Philadelphia Suburban Transit, which 
also operated double end PCCs, but a different different model. This is the Sunset Tunnel. This is the end line at the west end of the Sunset Tunnel. You can actually read built 1926. This is uh, I love that donut world. Uh, this is the curve at Judah and the ninth somewhere. Right? Yeah. And then, yeah, the, I took some pictures from a parking garage at the University of California, which overlooks the end line. Excellent place. This is the line that goes through the park at Missy under the J line and then winds its way. The reason it does this is because this is very steep street. This is a very, goes uphill and downhill. So to avoid the hill, they kind of built it a little bit around the hill. So this is the right of way through the park. And there it is going downhill. This is on San Jose Avenue. This is a relatively new section of the, of the Muni system. This was an extension of the J line, so it would connect to Balboa Park and they would have full. Of, and I was very lucky one day to see a deadheading former Melbourne trolley on this line. This it wouldn't be a, in carrying passengers. Um, here we are at Caltrain, uh, where the N and the T line go. And this is a picture from, I'm just looking it up. Uh, one of these shows the older locomotives. So this might be 2010. And then this is, I think, 2016, where they have, as you can see, the newer newer locomotives in place. And then I'm ending the show with a couple of shots of New York City. I wonder if people, I don't know how many of our members have been to Governor's Island, which gives you a really nice view of uh, the Wall Street area. Right. And then I had some, um, I was invited, I can't remember, it was some kind of event for my alumni mm -hmm. where I had a really nice view looking out, as you can see, towards the new Bryant Park building and uh, the Empire State Building. So if we still, if anyone's still interested, we, we've done the two hours. Right. And I do have some bonus things if anybody wants to hold Go on. ahead. Go ahead. And go ahead and show it people who can always, we've had a few people drop, just go ahead and show yeah. it. There's only 25 pictures. That's fine, go ahead. Um, this was taken in 2006, whoops. This is the, uh, trolley museum in um, Rock Hill, where it meets with the uh, East Broadtop. This was taken in 2006, which was the only other time I was there. And then I was there last weekend for the reopening of the East Broadtop. Um, interestingly, this car, we rode this car this time uh, last weekend. They never closed the doors on it. This was, I guess, because it was October, it was colder back in 2006, that they had the sliding doors closed. They had two of the former Porto cars out in 2006 and a Johnstown car. And the steam engine number 15 was still operational. It isn't right now. Um, they had the snow plow out in 2006. This is a view of everything. They had, a, they had the bullet car running. This I don't believe was out running. It may have just been parked. And then, yeah, this is 2006. This is actually done with a relatively low, the friend of mine's camera that surprisingly looks good. This is a much lower megapixel than what we are used to now. The M1 was out in 2006. I was told M1 was running last weekend, but not the day I was there. This is a gasoline powered rail car on the narrow gauge. So here's M1 in 2006 and a, a trolley plow as well. There it is from, uh, from Philadelphia, I guess, PST. And there's M1. Where, where are you again? Can you identify? This is Rock Hill Furnace. This is East Broadtop in Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, right. Orbisonia Rock Hill Furnace. This was the last picture from 2006. You'll see the headlight is on. And here we are this year. They just parked the trains here. They even have, see, they moved some of the coal cars around. These are all not operational right now. They have to rebuild these engines. 
This railroad, the history of the East Broadtop is that it was the last operating narrow gauge in the East. It ran until 1956 until their last coal customer didn't need their coal anymore. And they literally shut down from one day to the next. And the entire railroad was sort of mothballed. And the company that was supposed to salvage it and pull it up, reopened it in 1960 as a tourist attraction. And then they gave it up in 2011. So for the last nine years, it's been sitting, there's a group called the Friends of East Broadtop who are bringing it back. And there's investors now, including um, Henry Posner of one of the short line companies that is investing in it and trying to restart the whole thing. So last weekend was their opening 60th anniversary of the 1960 reopening. So that's why I went. Here's number 15. They did pull it out. It, they need to tear it apart and rebuild it because it's, it's expired, but you know, it's still there. It's running. They have a really nice uh, old, uh, you know, parlor car. And yes, they had the trolleys out again, the Johnstown car, the York car. They have an original San Diego. That's their newest equipment. They have one of the San Diego Siemens cars with the added air conditioning. There's a Philadelphia car set for Route 23 which was not out. See, they had the doors open last weekend. They never closed the doors on the York car. They had one of the Porto cars. There's a Johnstown car. And this is a couple of shots I took in Philadelphia. I was very lucky. This is back in 2010, very soon after the Girard line reopened. And I happened to get a picture of it in front of Girard College with a car in the way, uh, which is very, very hard to do. This is, it was very well used. This is right under the Frankfurt L. Um, this is out on uh, Richmond Street. And this is a few years later at the Loop at the Sugar House Casino. And as we all know, the 15 is shut down and for all we know, SEPTA may never turn it back on again. So that's the end of my show. Okay, so thank you very much, Andrew. I have shared my email address and uh, yours, please, please feel free to send uh, feedback. Uh, again, if any of you are interested in making a presentation, I can't promise the time, uh, email me and I will refer you to Andrew Grohl. So if now- If anybody wants to try, I was, remember we were gonna show some videos. Oh, sure, you wanna show those? Go ahead. Let me try one and see how it works for people. Go ahead. This Go is ahead. one of- uh, <laughs> Doing the running brake test. Yeah. <laughs> guys hear the video for the sound from that perfect yes oh good all right and then the other one i was going to show of it going around the curve at rock hill okay <laughs>
okay. I was just looking at the video on my other computer. It is a little bit jerky. Somehow. It's fine. Mm. This is the best I've seen. And Eric, you're okay. getting compliments here, right and left. All right. So thank, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, people, you're welcome to unmute yourself and turn on your video. You have to do it. I can't. I will leave this on for about 15